Said that, allow me to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, who is a human resources function at, who, who leads the human resources function at Indigo, uh, India's largest airline by market share, and is a key member of Indigo's executive management committee. Prior to this, he was Amazon's head of human resources for Asia Pacific and Middle East, for their international consumer business and global technology development centers in the region. Earlier, he was the head of HR for GE's Global Research and India Technology Centers. Starting his HR career in the late 80s, he has held several senior HR leadership positions across geographies in Hindustan, Unilever, Ford Motor Company, and HSBC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the senior vice president and head of human resources, Indigo, Mr. Raj Raghavan. Such a pleasure to be in uh, Nepal this morning and uh, such a pleasure to see a full house in the midst of uh, COVID and uh, all of that we are talking about today. Um, I have a bottle of water with me. It's a long session. Um, at least two hours is what I'm told. I'm not sure I can last that long. Um, one of the two things can happen, right, in, in a two-hour session. One is... Uh, you can feel uh, absolutely good about it and say, hey, go on longer, Raj. You know, do another two hours. Very unlikely. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Shah Rukh Khan, so, uh, um, so I, that's unlikely. The other way is, okay, this is a nice uh, ballroom and uh, you can uh, reduce the AC a little bit, reduce the lights a little bit and take a nice nap. But you know what, um, I wish the later does not happen. And, um, you know, I learn from you as much as, uh, you know, uh, you can all learn uh, from me today. Um, Dr. Koirala was uh, very impressive, I thought. He was very understated in the way he spoke. But I thought uh, some of the uh, pointers he gave were extremely relevant. He's not here, but I told him when he was sitting next to me, I said to him, well, you mentioned you're not a management expert, <clears throat> but the amount of uh, little management tips that he gave uh, probably are the most uh, important tips we can, we can ever get. And uh, uh, getting, getting that from uh, Nepal's uh, uh, you know, foremost uh, heart surgeon is, I think, uh, you know, well worth the time we all spent. All right, so are we all good for the next uh, two hours? Am I scaring you by saying two hours or is that okay? <laughs> all right, so I want to start by asking you, is change easy or difficult? Is change easy? So whoever thinks change is easy, can you put your hands up, please? Personal change, change in our life. All right, I see one, two, three, not a whole lot of people. So others think change is difficult. So those of you who think change is difficult, can you put your hands up, please? Oh, that's a lot of you. Okay, so shall we start with something very simple? Those of you at least who said change is difficult. Can you please get up? All of you who think change is difficult? Right. Go find yourself a table at least 10 feet walking distance from where you are and sit there. Move around. Go find another place. So those of you who are walking around must be thinking, I could have easily said change is easy. <laughs> but if everybody said change was easy, I would have asked you to do exactly this. All right. So some people, people at the back are not walking. I can see that. <laughs> but I think they think change is easy. We'll come to you in just a second's time, okay? All right. Okay, settle down now. 
<laughs> so these, these tables are completely empty in the front. Please come here, I'm not going to eat you, okay? Come, come, please. All right. Thank you so very much. Was this easy or was this difficult? Just moving around, was it easy or difficult? Difficult, right? To be uh, moving around from um, just, I, and imagine you have been sitting in this chair for probably less than 45 minutes this morning, right? So how many of you are married in this room? Okay, many of you are married, right? And uh, I'm going to ask you a personal question. So when you sleep at night on your bed, there is a particular side of the bed you sleep at, right? All the time? Can, you, can I see people, you know, do all of you use the same side of the bed every night? Put your hands up, please. Okay. Why don't you do this for a change today? Go tell your husband or your wife. <laughs> Go to the other side of the bed and see what he or she tells you. Then you will know change is not an easy thing. It's a big problem. Change is a big problem. Why change, right? Everything is going fine. We get our meal, we get our coffee, we get our dinner. Why change? Now, Dr. Koirala was talking about organizational change, right? I'm telling you, organizational change is probably more easier than personal change. Personal change is where the whole thing starts. And uh, personal change is where the whole thing stops. If you can't change, it just stops. And uh, to that extent, I think, organization change, you know, basically follows personal change. You know, going back in history, and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a great believer in history and uh, lessons you learn from, from history. Right from the time of the Greek uh, philosophers to later, you know, Aristotle's and uh, Asian philosophers to even uh, the latest, uh, you know, Buddhist uh, monk in uh, Vietnam. I don't know if you know of him or not. Thich Nhat Hanh. How many of you have heard of Thich Nhat Hanh? Uh, we call him Thai. And uh, the greatest thinkers, all of them have been focusing on one thing. And that's about embracing. Now, embracing can be a person to another, embracing a situation, embracing change. And I want to compliment you, uh, Mohanji, for thinking about the topic of embracing the change. And Shivani, thanks for introducing me uh, this morning to this audience. So what I'm going to use is a few slides. Now, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint slides, but uh, you know, when it comes to a longer session, there is always a, there's an anchor. Many years ago, one of my colleagues uh, said, isn't there a life beyond PowerPoint? Right, and I used to work in GE for a long time. I don't know how many of you have worked in General Electric. I worked uh, both in India and in the United States. And uh, anything you did in uh, GE was a PowerPoint. So you had a PowerPoint slide and you told, you know, I'm going to walk you through the PowerPoint slide. To an extent, I got so worried that even talking to my wife, I need a PowerPoint slide, <laughs> right? And then I went to Amazon. I did, I did 11 years in GE, and uh, like any case, I started in uh, Unilever back in India, and I'll talk about my career in just a second's time. If you can get this slide up, uh, please, uh, Shivani. And then I went to Amazon, and uh, I don't know how many of you know Amazon here? Do a lot of you know Amazon? All oh, right, I think so. And at Amazon, you did not use PowerPoint slides. What a change, for 11 years, I was used to using only PowerPoint slides because half the time, I don't even have to say anything, I'll just tell them, look, it's there in the slide, please read it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then you go to Amazon, Amazon says, well, we don't want any PowerPoint slides, not because they did not like Microsoft, right? And Amazon used to hire heavily from Microsoft and Microsoft used to hire heavily from Amazon as well. But they said PowerPoint slides actually do not give you a lot of information. 
Don't you think so? You know, you have one page of something written in there, unless the writer comes there and explains to you what he or she has written, you don't even know what is written there. And to that extent, Amazon made it even more interesting. So at Amazon, you don't write PowerPoint slides. If you have a PowerPoint slide, you're fired. Literally, you don't have a job. So then what do you do? How do you tell your concept? It's what they call the written word. Like all of us went to kindergarten school where you were asked to write, uh, you know, they, they took you on an excursion. Does that happen in Nepal as well? You go on an excursion as a young, young kid. Do your children go on a picnic? And then you come back, the next day the teacher tells you, please write one paragraph about the picnic you went to, right? So to that extent, you know, I, I have a son who's 18 years old, 17 years old, he'll be 18. So when he was about four or five years old, we had just come back from the US. So we, I worked in the US for some time, we brought him back. And then we put him into the school, this international school in Bangalore, India. And uh, they, they, they said, there is a picnic happening day after tomorrow. We are going to this place in a bus, coming back in a bus. So the son of mine puts his hand up and says, teacher, can I ask you a question? She says, yeah, please go ahead. And he says, teacher, will you ask me to write uh, a one page picnic notes after the end of the picnic? And she says, she was just looking at him. She says, if you're going to do that, I'm not coming to the picnic. <laughs> right? So at Amazon, you had to write everything. Your, your ideas had to be written down and the maximum you can write is six pages. And uh, the six pages have to be in Arial font 11. Can it be more prescriptive than this? <laughs> because they don't want you to use a small font of five and say, you know, uh, uh, complete a 12 page document into a six. They, they did not allow you to do that. Why I'm saying this is, you know, even as some of you make, you know, your own changes and uh, uh, simple things like these uh, can, can come and have an impact. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my career. Is that okay? I only been in human resources. So uh, I was uh, I was telling um, I think Mr. Kadia this morning uh, that I started working in 1990, and I felt oh my God I'm really old. Am I? <laughs> How many of you were born in 1990? I don't know. I mean a lot of people look very very young here, and I don't want you to think I'm 100 years old. Okay, um, but uh, um, so. Uh, I graduated in, um, my undergrad was in economics and my master's was in personnel management and industrial relations. Uh, later, I went on to do an executive uh, MBA at the INSEAD school in France uh, and in Singapore. Then I did a fellow program at the Wharton School. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a lot later. Um, my first job was where uh, Aniket works uh, now. So this was in uh, Unilever. That was my first significant job. I was all of 23 years old, I think, 22 or 23 years old. And I go to this manufacturing plant. So they initially gave me um, a role in sales. I did that for about three months. Um, I didn't like it. So I called my boss, um, who, I, who I still call uh, the way uh, He's still a mentor and a great friend of mine. I called him and I said, Dave Saab, I really want to go work in a factory. Please give me something. And he said, uh, yeah, we'll give you something. Just wait. In three months time, so he called and he said, there is this job going in this manufacturing plant called Gutkeser. Will you go? I didn't even know where it was. I said, no, I will go. Uh, the reason is I just wanted to be in, in manufacturing. So I go to this plant. It's a very old legacy plant, and, and I know some of you in Nepal are used to unions, right? I mean, you, you work with unions, you worked with unions before. This was a very old legacy plant, uh, about 100 years old, uh, almost like a 70-acre kind of uh, property, uh, about 1,800 employees. And uh, the first problem that ever came to me was this. There was this person who's a fitter in the, in the factory. He comes in. And then he tells me, sir, I have a big complaint against this company. I said, what is your complaint? He said, my, uh, um, I'm retiring this year. I said, why are you complaining? You're attaining a certain age and you're retiring, right? He says, no, sir, that is not my complaint. 
I said, what is your complaint? Two of my older brothers are still working in this factory. How can I retire? <laughs> he said, okay, this is a problem. How do I handle it? He said, sir, your uh, HR systems are bad. This was back in 1990, 30 years ago, right? And uh, when you see Rigo here, and I'm saying, okay, if there was some way of, you know, asking for somebody's date of birth. Those days, nobody asked for a date of birth, I think. They just looked at your face and they asked you, what is your name? If I said my name is Bhagwan Koirala, they would have still hired me. <laughs> right? And uh, so that was an easy one. And then in about two hours' time, there is this person who comes in to my office. And uh, I was still 23 years old. And this factory is about 100 years old. And when they gave me this job, I used to think, oh my God, nobody is good enough to go do this job, so they gave it to me. And I go there, I sit down here, there's this gentleman comes, soaked in blood from head to toe. He's bleeding. And some 20 people around him, and they are shouting, call the police, call the police, call the police. I told them, what do you mean? I mean, this guy is bleeding, call the doctor. Why are you calling the police? And they didn't appreciate my humor, right? It was not a fun moment. They said, no, 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 call the police. And then I realized there was this uh, fist fight between uh, three unions, and this person got injured. And by the time I realized what I did, the police was already inside the factory. And, uh, and there was uh, arsoning, and there was uh, tear gas shells. But one thing I learned in my college was I can do a lockout. I don't know if that is possible in Nepal, but uh, any, any part of the world, you can do that. So I said, okay, let us lock, lock out. So we locked it out. I joined the, my job at 8 o'clock in the morning. By 12 o'clock, the factory was locked out, right? Completely locked out. My very first job. And I was, I was uh, dating my wife then. You know, I got married when I was really young. I was 26 years old when I got married. And I told my wife, you know, I have this beautiful job in this fantastic company. Let's get married really soon. I was waiting for her to become a major. She was still under 18 those days, right? And then uh, I, my boss calls me from Bangalore, and he says, Raj, what did you do? I said, sir, I don't know. I didn't do anything. Oh, that is the reason. <laughs> so you didn't do anything. He said, don't worry. Let's see what we can do. I'm coming tomorrow morning, and we will fix it. So, um, the, and, and this Gatkeser is, is act, is, was, was about 60 kilometers from Hyderabad. I don't know if you know Hyderabad. Hyderabad is central India. Then I said, let me go see him even before he comes. So I took a cab. I used to live inside the factory. So they gave me a big bungalow inside the factory. And I was feeling really good about my job. You know, big bungalow, 23 years old, and there is a cook and all of that. I mean, we don't have that these days in Unilever anymore. Those days they had it. I used to think, you know, no. And then I realized nobody wanted this job. So they gave it to me. So I went to this. Uh, so when on my way to the uh, airport, it was a 60-kilometer drive. Al it took almost an hour those days, or probably longer. I was telling myself, Raj, you're going to get dismissed today. They're going to fire you. You're not going to have your job anymore. So then I was thinking, how do I find another job? So that was all I was thinking about. And, uh, and I was telling, well, I should ask uh, you know, Mr. Dave, please give me at least six months notice, sir. I'll go find another job. Then I was trying to tell myself, what do I go tell my, uh, my fiancé, my wife right now? What do I tell my father? My father is a technologist, right? He, uh, he used to work for Indian Institute of Technology in, um, in Madras and before that in Bombay. He always told me, Raj, what is this human resource management all about? Those days they called it personnel management, right? And he actually thought I was studying to become a personal secretary. And he's, he's, he asked me, why do you have to study two years to become a personal secretary? I had to tell him, Dad, no, it's not personal secretary, it's personal management. He said, whatever it is, but who will give you a job, right? And finally, when they gave me a job in Unilever, he said, oh my God, they hired you? I said, yeah, <laughs> but what will you do? <laughs> in IIT Madras, we don't have any personal management. So I was actually worried, what am I going to tell him? Because he always thought, if you have to be fed three days, three times a day, you better be an engineer. So if you're not an engineer, you only get two meals a day. And you, I used to be very thin those days, OK? <laughs> That's humor, guys. You can smile. <laughs> right. So then I go to this uh, airport, and I meet uh, Mr. Dave. And then he comes out, and he gives me a big hug. I, I was quite shocked. I didn't know what to react, because I thought I was going to get fired. And uh, he said, Raj, 
you have done what I could not do for several years. I said, what, sir? You only hugged me. I did not hug you. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. We wanted to tell this factory that discipline is very important. So one thing led to another, and we went to the factory, and then we went to the regional labor commissioner. It took three months, actually. So it was a tripartite settlement. I worked really, really hard those days. The reason I'm telling you this story is not to talk about myself, is to talk about change. You know, the way you think about work, the way you think about what you have already done, a lot of times we will all be in situations that we have never faced before, right? But if you think about your own lives, you know, be it in school or in college or at work or in personal lives, you have always handled probably seven to eight out of the 10 situations really well, right? And uh, the three to two situations that you did not handle really well are those things where you did not involve yourself completely. And uh, my biggest learning from my first job was that as long as you're committed to doing what you want to do and don't run away from the problem. In fact, uh, you know, at that time, during that time, my grandfather's death happened. And my grandfather was very, very dear to me. And uh, even now he's very dear to me. And he died at that point in time. I didn't even go for his funeral because I was so, I was so caught up at this work. And uh, I actually told Dave Sahib, he said, no, you leave now. But I could not have left. I called my grandmother and I told her, sorry, I can't come, but I will come back and see you one day. So when you do these things, it works. So I didn't complete the story yet. So let me tell you the story a little more completely. So it took three months. And finally, we opened the factory. And when we opened the factory, uh, my factory uh, general manager, a gentleman by name Subrotho Biswas, and he's still a very, very dear friend. Both these gentlemen are probably in their mid 80s now. And he said, Raj, uh, you're the one that really worked very hard for this factory to restart. So I want you to uh, speak to all the three union leaders. I will be there and with their members and uh, we'll welcome all of them. I said, yes, sir, we will do that. But we stood at the gate of the factory, 1800 employees coming in and we gave them all sweets and told them, please come back, you know. And we did all this and this union meeting happened. And it was a hall probably this big, you know, the size of this uh, podium here and some 20 people sitting. And uh, Mr. Biswa says, uh, so Raj, uh, you know, is our young uh, factory personnel manager, has worked very hard with all of you, so I want him to say a few words. I don't know whatever happened in my head at that point of time. I said something like this. I said, if you're going to create ruckus like this for small reasons, this factory will be shut permanently. And they got so angry with what I said. They said, oh, this is what they sent you here for, to shut this factory down. Because I took over from somebody who was 58 years old, and he retired. And they thought, you know, this, this, this management must be mad, you know, to replace a 58-year-old man with a 23-year-old man. And uh, I'll be 58 in about five years' time. So, <laughs> you know, four and a half, five years' time. Those days, 58 was really old, right? When I, that's what I used to think when I was 23. Now I'm thinking 58 is not so old. I'm only 54 now, right? So I'm actually thinking I can work till about 70 years old. But young people like you, you're going to kick me out. And then uh, one union leader said, I don't like this. I take objection. My, my union members and I are calling a strike. We are walking out. I said, my God, man, after three months we started this, these guys are walking out. The second union leader stood up and said, if this person can walk out, I will also walk out. So about 600 to 700 employees just walked out of the gate. And there was only one union leader who looked at me and he must have thought, poor fellow, you know, he needs a job, you know, young boy, let's give him a chance. So he said to me, you know, Raj, we will stand by you. Let us do what it takes. Let's continue with the factory. And when 1,200 people were working, 600 people were out, in the, in the next week's time, I worked so hard to get all the 600 people back. And mind you, I did not have any labor relations experience. I used a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, to take support. There was a time in the three months time when the factory was completely shut. We used to run an instant coffee plant. Do you know instant coffee, right? Where you put coffee powder and then put milk and then, ooh, that nice aroma comes and you start drinking the coffee, right? So that instant coffee plant could not be shut down because it was a continuous process factory. Then we brought uh, officers from other factories 
there were two, three personnel managers. We all used to run the factory. We used to produce instant coffee. And uh, we did not know how to pack it, but we all produced them and put them in, in big bags and send them to another place for packing. So, you know, you will, you will come across a lot of situations in life that you have never handled before, but deal, deal with them with uh, some amount of, uh, um, you know, um, intensity and embrace the, the problem. I'm not going to bother you with uh, all of my work experience. Is it going all right till now? Am I, am I boring you guys? Is it okay? Fine, thank you. I'm not going to bother you with all of that, but I'm going to just take one or two examples. I'll take the example from uh, uh, Ford Motor Company. So after five years working in Unilever, I joined uh, Ford Motor Company. And uh, I used to love Ford Motor Cars. And it was the first factory for uh, India. And uh, they never had a manufacturing plant. So the first six months, they moved me to uh, Michigan, which is where their uh, manufacturing, their headquarters was. And I was training at uh, the Dearborn, uh, Michigan uh, factory. And um, we used to then hire for uh, technicians. So the, the factory that was being built was in a city called Chennai in south of India, extreme south of India. And I hail from Chennai, so it was all nice. So I said, I, I'm going to take that. And that factory was uh, built in a 400-acre property. What we did not realize at that time was that 400 acres of land, while we bought it from the government, was actually owned by about eight, 900 farmers. Eight, 900 of them were farmers whose land was taken away because of some deal the government did, and the government sold it to us. What they did not tell us was that uh, these farmers were under the impression that their children are going to get jobs in the factory. Have you seen a situation like this before? Some of you have. And uh, guess what? In Ford Motor Company, we did not think we were going to give any of these people any jobs. And that was another big issue. And I'm not going to bore you with that. But what I'm going to tell you is another interesting anecdote. So I used to run what's called launch training function at Ford. How many of you are in the training uh, function here? How many of you do training? So some of you I can see. Sorry, there's a light on my eyes, so I can't see all of you, OK? And uh, so this training function was, was one of the most interesting assignments I ever had. So we, we recruited the technicians who had never worked in an automotive plant before. And we said we will train them to Ford standards, and we send them all over the world. And I was the big coordinator. So I used to have uh, about 20 people getting trained in Dagenham plant in the UK, about 40 of them in, uh, in Melbourne, Australia, a few in the United States. So I had a cushy job. I was sitting in the plane half the time, going across these locations and, uh, and helping people train. And this is not about change. This is about how you enjoy your work, is the example I'm going to give you. So this was a manufacturing plant in Melbourne where uh, we had uh, sent our people to. And some of you, if you realize, Melbourne is a city of a lot of cultures. So the manufacturing plant that we were at had about 60 nationalities, uh, who are all Australians, but they were all 60 nationalities. At the end of the uh, uh, course was over for our people, there was a graduation ceremony. And they invited me uh, to, to the graduation ceremony. So we were doing the graduations, we were doing thank you and all of that. And uh, so I was saying, you know, I want to thank all the Ford uh, Australia, you know, employees and workforce. And one of them stood up and said, I want to thank the Indian workforce for something. I said, oh, really? What do you want to thank us for? And there is this, uh, there is this market in Australia. I forgot the name. It's, it was called uh, Elizabeth Market or whatever in, in Melbourne. He said, I have lived in Melbourne all my life. My father has lived here. My grandfather has lived here. But the only people that could actually come and bargain for something to buy were Indians. And uh, we could never think that you can ever bargain in Australia. They taught me how to bargain here. So, so that, was, that, was, that was another one. Um, then I went to uh, uh, GE. In GE, the, I did a lot of work. Um, one example was, uh, so GE has this uh, state-of-the-art research center in upstate New York. A, a city called Niskayuna in New York. And uh, this was called the Global Research Center. 
and they had about 2,000 employees and uh, about 1,995 of them had PhDs. Who are the five that did not have? All the HR people. So, <laughs> so I used to tell, we bring down the average IQ of this uh, research center. So on my first few days, uh, I was going around to the various laboratories and uh, in one lab, there was an experiment going on and there were these two or three researchers. They said, Raj, can you please walk from this end of the room to that end of the room and come back. I said, what do you mean? Are you guys ragging me or uh, what? Is this how you integrate people? No, 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 please walk. So I, I went up there and I walked back and I stood right there in that corner. They all started clapping. I said, I mean, this is really not, not good. You guys are really teasing me. Why are you clapping me for? Then this guy said, we are actually experimenting wireless transfer of electricity. So we were moving electricity from this corner of the room to that corner of the room. And we wanted to know if human body is a good conductor or bad conductor of electricity. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I don't want to die in New York. <laughs> but they were just uh, making fun. So, you know, from managing uh, industrial workers to go manage these PhDs uh, was not easy. It, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of uh, commitment to understand what they do. As an HR professional, one thing that I've always learned, I'm, I'm making an assumption, many of you are from HR here. How many of you are from HR here? Okay, looks like the whole hall is uh, HR. You know, one of the things I, I learned very young in my life was for you to be respected as an HR professional, you have to understand the business really well. And that's what Unilever teaches you. In, uh, in the first three months as a, as a trainee in Unilever, you're actually sitting uh, in a motorbike, uh, you know, selling to the vendors coffee and tea and, uh, and all of that. So, you know, please do that. Those of you that are starting your career or those of you, those of you who are in the middle, middle of your career, the best person to go understand the business, who do you think is the best person to go understand the business from? Let me, let me ask this question. So if you're joining a company new as a HR director, who do you think is the best person that you can understand the business from? Sorry, I can't hear you. Marketing, okay. Sales, anyone else? Sorry? Customers, that's a great answer. That's a fantastic answer. But I've always found, go talk to the CFO. If you talk to the CFO, you will know everything that does not go right. Finance people will never give you good news, right? That's my, that's my final conclusion after 30 years of working. All bad news about the business will come from the head of finance. And the best way to learn business is to learn the bad news. So, so that is one tip if, if I were to uh, tell you. Um, now I'm uh, the head of HR at uh, Indigo, an Indian aviation company. And uh, one of the things we do extremely well at Indigo is being on time. So uh, in India, we are known to be on time. In fact, some customers tell me, I actually reset my watch looking at Indigo flight taking off. And we are doing that with uh, 1,700 departures a day. Uh, we have 280 airplanes, uh, 28,000 employees, fly to 85 different uh, locations within India, 25 locations outside India. And uh, one of the biggest things, so as an HR person, who also is uh, the head of the learning uh, center of the company, one of the biggest things that uh, I've been told is, how do you bring in this aspect of being on time as a culture within the company? It's not an easy problem. Understand this, right? The plane has to take off and land on time. And then somebody in the HR department is being asked, how do you make sure the culture of being on time, you know, stays the way it is? And then, um, you know, and then I said, well, it's a difficult question to answer, but let's try and do this. I said, why don't we start all our meetings on time? and end them on time. Is that difficult? But do we do it all the time? I don't know about Nepal, but most meetings where, where I've been in, either or delayed, 
or uh, either to start or to end. And we said in a, in a training course, so we, we run this academy called iFly, I-F-L-Y. And if any of you are in uh, New Delhi capital region anytime, give me a call. Monji's office has my number. I will take you across to our training center. At any given point of time, we have 70 courses that happen, 7-0. So 70 different classrooms. And uh, so take on an average about 15 people in a, in a class on an average. That makes it almost like 900 people in the, in, in the building. We have a cafeteria which can take exactly 180 people. That's the size of our cafeteria. And there are 900 people. So then working backwards. So we said, you know, firstly, the classes need to start on time. And the lunch break is from 11.30 till about 2 o'clock. And you have to exactly eat at that time. If you don't eat at that time, you don't get your meal. Now, there are times when you have to put your foot down and say, this is how you, know, you need to get, get stuff done. Otherwise, it's just never going to get done. Because if 900 people want to eat lunch at the same time, you know, one of the biggest uh, you know, jokes that uh, we used to have in the US, uh, especially, uh, or even in Australia, when I used to take food uh, employees is, Raj, I don't understand why all the 40 Indian trainees want to eat lunch at the same time, and they want to eat, sit in the same table. And the table can only take eight people, but they all want to insist in sitting there. And I said, that's camaraderie, right? But, but that goes against it. And, and so we said uh, we, ne we needed to do this. The second thing I did, so I have a chief learning officer who reports to me. And uh, outside her office, there is, there is a board this big. It's a physically written board. And the board has all the 70 courses written, the title of the course is written on the left-hand side. And then there is a green, yellow, red button on the top. And uh, so I, at about 9, 10 or, some, or something, so she goes and ticks either a green or a red or a yellow. Now, what does a green mean? A green means the course started on time, the class started on time. What does a yellow mean? Yellow means the course started, but 10 minutes late. 10 minutes late is an yellow. And what does a red mean? The course was, sorry, under, within zero to 10 minutes. And red is 10 minutes and above. So we don't want the classes to be delayed even by 10 minutes. And that's the culture we keep telling people all the time. And that's, that's a big lesson for me in change. You know, unless you are committed to doing the change, you will never get it done. And if it is red, you better save, you know, you have the real good examples or, or the real good reasons for you to, if you're a trainer. So we tell our trainers, you're like the pilot in the airplane. So if you're the commander of the airplane, imagine the plane is flying at 35,000 feet and uh, the commander is the boss. He cannot go or she cannot go and ask for help from anybody else. All she can do is the telephony, radio telephony, and whatever she has in the instrument panel and the people that are working with her. So we tell our, our uh, training uh, leaders or our trainers, you're like the commander of this, of this room. We don't want you to come and tell, tell us that uh, you know, the audio visual did not work, the water was not there, the air conditioner was bad. We want you to fix it much before the class starts. Now, that can come across as a bit you know, high-handed, right? But that's the only way you will get to the culture of, of being on time. So, so let me pause here. And uh, if you have any questions or any examples on, on this page, uh, I'll be happy to uh, hear them. Do we have microphones that we can give? So anyone that wants to ask a question or make a comment, uh, please raise your hand and I'll send the microphone around. Anyone? Mr. Kedia has a question here right in the front. When we, like, I don't want to say that as an employer, most of the meeting when we sit together, all that people like any association, all they have mobile in hand. And I've so sometimes the meeting goes for one hour not a single decision has been taken because everybody is within their mobile. So what is the solution for that? Yeah, the problem is, uh, Mr. Kedia, 20 years ago when there were no mobiles, we still did not take decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my view is, uh, 
mobile is not the problem. It's the intent that is the problem. Uh, you can have the mobile, but still make a decision. That, that comes with the culture. You know, oftentimes, you know, we think that we need to discuss, we need to understand, we need to hear, we need to participate. All those are great. I think really good. But many times in a company's organization culture, if people decide, you know, I'm just here to have good conversations and fix the time for the next meeting, you can take the mobile away from them. They will still not make a decision. So I think, I think you need to look at, uh, you know, the intensity. Again, I go back to intensity and the intention, right? The problem with the intention is all of us have good intentions. Can you follow me? Am I, am I under, I'm understandable? All of us have good intentions. Who has a bad intention? None of you, this gentleman sitting here, is, is the intention for you, sir, is to come here, learn something, take it back, right? You, your intention is not, oh, this Raj is so boring, let me come here and slap him, right? That's not your intention. Everybody has a good intention. The problem with good intention is good intentions are not good enough. Because everybody says, you know, I need to be respectful to Mr. Kedia, to Moanji, to Aniket, to you. And in that process, I don't want to make tough decisions. So one of the uh, things that I used to tell myself is, so if good intentions are not good enough, then what is good enough? Right? So I'm saying good intentions is not good enough, okay then what is good enough? In my mind, the answer is mechanism. What is a mechanism? You need to have a method to follow in order for your good intention to be fructifying. So use methods, use logic, and make sure good intentions don't come to a stop. So I don't know if this answered your question, sir. Any other question? Okay, going one. All right, Aniket has one and uh, the lady there. So can I take your question first? And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get you the microphone, yeah. You have a microphone? All right. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Praveen Pradhan and I'm representing a company called Nimbus. Uh, you mentioned about change and being on time and I have been a frequent flyer with Indigo, so great services out there. Uh, I had a question, um, how do you suggest uh, the change, uh, the culture that you're talking about, how do you suggest that, um, um, I'm sorry, how do you suggest we begin the culture of being on time within the organizations? No, that's a great question, yeah. uh, Ms. Pradhan. That is uh, a very clear intent. So what we do is, uh, at, at Indigo, uh, in a new employee orientation, we say there are just three things that we want you to know about Indigo. Just three things, and remember this all the time. One is being on time. And, and I'll come to each of the second is being uh, the most uh, cost effective company you can run. So being frugal. The third one is obsessive customer culture. These are the three things. One is on time, second is cost, third is the customer. We don't give them you know, a huge gyan of 40 pages on, on culture and all of that. Now, being on time is, doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen because I have a good intention. It happens because I have processes that follow. So in order for an airplane to be on time, Ms. Pradhan, we follow a process called, so we, on time is called OTP, on time performance. And we say in order for you to get 100% OTP, you need to follow OTT, right? What is OTT? On time turn. Now the airplanes are very expensive, right? Each of these planes, you know, at, the, at, at a very minimum of $50 million, and we have 280 of them, right? So uh, if, and, and the planes, because of the short routes that we fly, right, we are not a, um, a, a a long route uh, carrier at all. These are narrow body planes, a single aisle with uh, 186 to 230 seats. And then we also have uh, the ATR uh, 700s, which have uh, 60 seats, right?
right? So these planes, uh, so the, the longer you utilize the plane, the lower the cost will be. So each of these three, see w while I talked about on time, cost also is a reflection of how you use your time, right? So we say on time turn. So we have the lowest turn time among every Indian carrier. And, uh, and our technical reliance on takeoffs, the engineering technical reliance is what they call 99.87%. So people work like honeybees. So the plane comes in and we want the plane to be able to take off in exactly 45 minutes in a busy airport like Delhi. If it's a smaller airport, our turn time is even lesser, it's 35 minutes. If it's an ATR, the turn time is exactly 30 minutes. So, so these need to get followed. This is not a management advice that you give and it doesn't work uh, like that. So if that helps you, so I don't understand the, the, uh, your company's background, but, but have mechanisms under each of these. One is starting meeting on time, on time turns. On time turn would mean you need, so, so the airplane cannot, uh, for, for, I told you we have 28,000 employees and 280 planes, which means for every plane we have 100 employees. So it takes 100 employees for the plane to take off and land. Now, these 100 employees will not be in Kathmandu. Kathmandu has probably 15 of us because we only do 11 flights a week to Kathmandu. But uh, a place like uh, New Delhi, where we do 170 departures a day, uh, we have over 2,000 employees or 3,000 employees. So all this works well. So Anikid, you had a question. Th did this answer your question? All right, thanks. Thanks, Raj. Uh, very warm welcome to the HRME 2022. I have a question which can be a generalistic question for an HR professional. You know, similar to you, I started my career from factories and we handle shop floor employees. Yeah. And suddenly the person has moved to a different role where there are white collar employees, the PhDs, uh, the career aspirations from a very, you know, from a factory role where there could be safety shoe, there could be uniform and suddenly shifting to a space where white collars will discuss about career aspirations, how am I going to move? What kind of advice do you have for the young professionals that how quickly you adapt to those situations and how quickly can you change, but which gear to apply in order to, uh, you know, uh, in order to deliver in the new role? So, so the question is specific to me, but it can benefit the audience as well. No, that's a great question. In fact, I remember asking this question of, uh, the chairman of Unilever Arabia. Uh, there was uh, this guy called Gopal, and Gopal uh, then became the executive director on Tata, Tata Sons, and he's now retired. I asked him exactly this question. I said, what advice will you give me so, so I understand my career? He said, Raj, only one advice. Deserve before you desire. And that was such a such an advice, it, it just stuck onto my head. This is a philosophical answer, okay? Don't get me wrong. The problem with a lot of us, right, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of you from management schools, and again, I'm not gonna ask you to put your hand up and say, who are you from management schools, but a lot of us think that because we went to a management school, we, we actually, uh, you know, uh, deserve uh, a lot more than uh, this. My own view is uh, how I have done my career. Lots of people tell me, Raj, why have you only been in HR? The simple answer is nobody else hired me. <laughs> okay, I just stayed in HR because I stayed in HR 30 years. Wow, 32 I think. But uh, I've, I've done so many different things. So I've, I've done recruiting, I've done comp, I've done industrial relations, I've done training. Uh, I've been in Indian, uh, you know, I've been in India, I've been in the US, I've worked in Beijing. And uh, so try and get these variety of experiences. And uh, the second most important thing is, uh, can your boss trust you to do a business presentation if she is unwell? That is when you, know, you have gained the trust of the, the, the business, not just, so if, if your boss thinks, oh, you know, he's an HR manager, he can talk about people, that is good because that's what you're being hired for. But if your boss thinks, you know what, Aniket can be a better uh, spokesperson in uh, Lever House in Bombay than even my CFO, that's when you think, you know, you can go ask for another job, so. All right, so I'm gonna go move on with uh, the other uh, ones. Um, this page is basically just a informational page. Um, you know, the aviation industry, and, and some, many of you are from the financial services industry here, right? Right, 
it's a highly regulated uh, industry. Everything is, my training room is uh, regulated. The pilots are regulated. The cabin crew is regulated. The engineers are regulated. The person who actually gives you your boarding pass is regulated. The person who lets you inside the plane is regulated. And by that I mean, there is a certain way to follow. And uh, if you notice, when you're inside an airplane, the co-pilot actually wears an yellow jacket and goes down after everybody is almost boarded. And then he has to go do a visual check of a check that has already been done by an engineer whose work has already been checked by somebody else. So basically the intent is, you know, how can you get safety very, very first? And uh, so I talked about uh, the three, three pillars. So on time, low cost, and uh, hassle free. Um, now the last two years have been most interesting for us, again from a change standpoint. Remote working was largely unknown in this industry. So I came from Amazon, where even in good days we used to work remotely. I used to call my boss and say, you know what, I have to take my son to the school today, so I'm going to work from home. These two hours I'm not going to be around, right? I don't know if that's possible in Nepal or not, but it was possible in Amazon. You come to uh, Indigo, 95% of your workforce cannot work from home. Now imagine, you sit in a plane all ready to take off, and the captain speaks from the microphone and says, this is your captain speaking, I'm working from home today, but I will fly you remotely. <laughs> so what will be your confidence of flying on that plane? So, so the issue that we had was, how do we make sure that small 5% population understand that everybody else is braving through the pandemic, and I can't be just sitting at home, yet we don't want you to take risks. So Unilever did something very significant, and I don't think we got there as well. Unilever said, whoever can work from home, please work from home. And, uh, but we could not say that. We said, you know, whenever it's possible for you to come back to work, please come back to work. So I've been actually back uh, work, uh, at work from May 25, 2020. So when the two-month uh, you know, lockdown was they ended. And uh, I still travel uh, eight times a month because I live in New Delhi, but my family lives in Chennai. And uh, so I keep going back and forth. Uh, eight times a month. So I, I, I do more than 100 flights a year. And uh, I, I not only fly Indigo, I also fly other airlines just to see how, how they work. So it's, uh, it's uh, like this. And I talked to you and I said about the multi-generational workforce. Again, you know, as an HR manager, the one thing that I keep always telling myself is the same, you know, uh, rhetoric or the same theory or the same way I deliver message is not going to be good enough with multi-generational workforce. You know, my age, people will still listen, but you know, my son doesn't. You know, the other day I was telling uh, my son, you know what, Rude, when I was your age, we only had one pair of shoes and we used to walk to school. We had three pairs of uniforms and uh, you know, if the shoe was torn, you know, we still had to wear it. He said, then I was trying to tell him that you know, it's very important for you to know that we all have plenty now and you need to spend your money well. So he thought for a while and he said, so dad, did you eat every day or <laughs> once in two days? <laughs> then I said, shut up. So I cannot, I cannot give the same way, uh, so again, uh, for, for, for a change. Um, this, was a, this was a picture that, uh, this is actually a plaque one of my uh, colleagues gifted me when he, re when he left uh, Indigo, and, and I really liked it. And this, uh, this shows a little bit about me. And uh, then I said, you know, when I talked about, I am the most important component for change than the company, I thought this was a, this was a great story. Firstly, you know, um, I'm sitting on these books. I normally don't sit on books. Uh, I never sit on books. That is because, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing my um, executive uh, PhD at the Indian School of Business. Even as, even as I work. So, um, so that is what it says. And uh, if you see uh, uh, this one here, I, I play uh, the tabla. Actually, my, my, um, my son and I play the tabla together. And uh, so that's, that's a great uh, uh, stress buster for me. And uh, here, this is this uh, small little radio. Now, probably none of you ever hear music on radios, right? You all probably hear it on your mobile phones. Spotify, whatever, but I still have this. So this is called Hangama. Hangama is a very Indian uh, station. It comes with something like, I think 5,000 songs. And, uh, and it, uh, it actually moves and 
I listen to it, and my son thinks I'm, I'm mad. This is an old man, <laughs> right? But I still have that. And then um, we have this little fellow up here. His name is Duke. Um, uh, where is he? Yeah, here. So Duke is a Siberian Husky, and uh, he's, uh, he's, he's very much a part and parcel of my life. And this is the three of us uh, right here. Um, my, my, this is my wife, uh, our son, and I. So it's, it's a small family, three of us, and uh, that's us. So um, in order for me to, uh, to embrace change, I need to know who am I at work, what do I want to do back home, what are the passions I want to pursue, and then, and then the other things. All of us are a whole. We are not a, we are not a part. So I would say if, if you're thinking of your personal change, uh, write down on a piece of paper what are those things you want to change firstly and uh, what do you need to be for those changes to happen and where the gaps are, right? So let's take a simple example. One change you, some of us may say is, I want to change a job, right? I want to be working in another company. Now, I would say in order for that to happen, you need to answer a bunch of your questions. It's not just applying for another job. It is about making yourself ready and you know, having the, uh, the credentials and the skills and the experiences to get there. And then find out what the gaps are. So if on one on 10, you're at about seven or something, that's fine. But if you're on a four, work towards getting to those seven. Does that make sense? All right, so we are close to 11 o'clock now. Um, any, other, uh, any other examples or experiences you like to give from uh, your life? Any, any of you, any, any change that you want to share with the group? I'm sure there are a lot of people here you could, you probably have undergone and you can say that, uh, you know, in English or in Nepalese, whatever mm. you want. Or you want to think about, oh, there, is, there he is, yeah. Hello, hello, sir. Uh, can I ask? I'm here. Oh, yeah, sure. Let me just come down, okay? Yeah, I can see you now. Uh, good morning, all. Good morning, Raj, sir. Uh, so, I'm Samiksha. I'm working as HR in uh, k and Engineering Consulting HR Department. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding on-time culture. So uh, I think most of us are facing this problem. Are, it's regarding the lunch hour. So uh, <laughs> basically, company provides one hour of lunch break. But uh, when there is a nine hour of uh, working hours per day, we have to provide two times a uh, two-time lunch break. Like right now, we are providing two-time lunch break. But now, what and employees were exceeding one hour of time. And now what we have decided, management have decided is the time will be fixed for one hour. So we cannot exceed the time. So employees are having a lot of problems right now so regarding that. So uh, any suggestion or any uh, comments on that, sir? One hour is a long time to eat lunch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Why it's are a long you guys time. complaining? <laughs> yeah, but when, as you said, that change is really difficult. Before no, the you have were, to learn. Yeah. You have to learn to eat fast. I mean, one hour, <laughs> one hour is really long. I mean, no other part of the world you will get one Actually, hour for lunch for, and still complain. Two, two times, like one time they, they go for lunch, one time they go for snacks. So I we know. are struggling with setting up. No wonder, like Dr. Koirala that. said, right? We all have heart attacks because of that. We eat so much. <laughs> yeah. You know, lunch for one hour, snack for one hour, and exactly. where do we work? Yeah, no, exactly. go tell we your are people. We have a lot of problems, sir, uh, like for con convincing employees. No, no, don't even convince. Tell them <laughs> this is what it is. I mean, what do you convince? I mean, I don't understand unless I'm, in a, I'm from a different world altogether. One hour for lunch is long. I eat on my desk. I eat in exactly 15 minutes. And when I'm eating uh, my lunch, I'm mm -hmm. still working. And I'm not saying we should all do that, but, you know, I, I buy on Amazon, I buy my air tickets, I, you know, I, I do a YouTube video, I, I watch TED Talks, and, and I'm doing this and I'm eating lunch, and one hour, is, one hour is long, young girl. Please tell your people that they should be back at work. Yeah, yeah sure, sir. Thank yeah, you so much. that's it. That's it. Don't give them, you know, training classes and all that. Tell them you better come back. That's it. Yeah, sure, sir. Thank you. <laughs> that's it. I don't know if that's, that works in the culture, but, uh, yeah. Hi, Russ, sir. Welcome to Nepal. 
So I'm Sobat, I'm from Afonsoft. So uh, I just want to relate, uh, you know, the embrace to change to, uh, to current scenario, which is currently prevailing right now in Nepal. So we have a kind of culture of six days of working, right? So I've been in India for last 10 years and like, you know, working for five days uh, in that sort of culture. So now it's more like a, you know, a national issue right now in Nepal that the government recently announced a five days working culture. So what's your view on this? Like, you know, it's a, a pretty much hotted, uh, you know, the, uh, the scenario right now here in Nepal that a lot of, you know, employers are not, you know, kind of reluctance is there to, you know, the swift uh, to that culture. So what's your view on this? I don't have a view on that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, be sure not to have a view on things the government says, right? I still, I still need to go back to my country, so I don't want to say something <laughs> and that I'll end up my uh, rest of a uh, few months in a Kathmandu jail. No, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, well, you know what, I'm not an expert on, um, on government affairs, and uh, if the government changes it from five to six, I, I don't know what my view should be. But if you were to ask me, um, what can I do to change? In order, to, uh, in order to work six days, I can tell you those things. Uh, but uh, but on, on the other hand, many governments in Europe are going to four days a week of working. Uh, I, my sense is it's not about the number of hours or number of days in a week that you work, it's about the productivity. So you need to start probably monitoring productivity and, uh, and get that. But, but I don't want to get into the view of what the government of Nepal has done, okay? Uh, so, hi, sir. I Hello. Yeah. 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 So I have I have two things to share. Firstly, very good ma'am. Good morning. Oh, nice. I am also from Unilever, and it's been my seven years now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I just want to share an experience of embracing change. Uh, so once I got married in 2015, and once and for all, uh, I got <laughs> married in 2015, and then I started my career in 2015 in Unilever. For seven years, I was like uh, having a very good life, uh, focusing only in my career, having good time with me and my husband. We were just staying here in Kathmandu, but only when I gave birth to my babies, twins. So then there was something that I was going through. It was difficult managing uh, home and then uh, work is what I used to fear. But then the, the change that was already in Unilever, but then yes, this uh, new scenario, the new future of work that is coming in, gave me a platform to embrace that change. For long, continuous two years, I've been working from home only, and recently I started uh, work going to office, and then that too in a flexible platform. So this is how me, myself, and my organization helped me embracing the change uh, that went in my life from having a individual life then to have, go on making on career along with my twins. So that was what I wanted to share. Uh, I have one question for you. No, thank you for the share firstly. I think <laughs> it's important for us to learn from each other and thanks for coming forward and sharing. Yeah. And being a Unilever alumni, I'm very proud. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> Do you uh, know this guy sitting in the front? Uh, yeah, he's my uh, manager. <laughs> like he's my leadership <laughs> manager. No, I know that, I mean, that was, that is my sense of humor. This is, is it landing all right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So my question is like getting out of comfort zone is always difficult for people. And uh, whenever there comes uh, like uh, mainly at the time when the change is uh, might be a career booster for that person. But anyway, that change uh, or that change of going out of comfort zone is uh, creating two changes that is in a person himself and herself and in a professional change, professional change also. So what would be your one or two tip to tackle the situation where people can embrace this personal and professional change in a one go, mm. just to come out of the comfort zone? Mm. That's a wonderful question. Yeah. You know, when you don't know an answer to a question, you should say it's a wonderful question. <laughs> okay. No, it's truly a wonderful question. I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I think, uh, please sit on, please sit on, don't understand. Okay. You know, um, I go back to what Dr. Koirala said. He talked about stability and change. Now, stability and change are the opposites of each other, right? But uh, you will never attain stability without change. You, you follow what I'm saying? You know, I, if, if you think that I can stand here for the rest of my life, I'll be under shade, there will be air conditioning. No, 
my, my legs will ache and I'll fall asleep and then I want to go home. So even to be stable, you need to have change. And I think uh, you, you gave a brilliant uh, example of your own career when you got married, when you have twins, you work from home, then you work from uh, office. I think uh, one of the big, I, you know, HR competencies that we will all require in the future is uh, understanding emotional health, right? I think that's going to be a that's going to be a big one. I mean, they don't teach us in college. Uh, they don't teach us in college. Nobody teaches that, uh, and many business leaders think it is very weak. But uh, mental wellness is going to define companies' financial performance in my in my mind. And uh, you know, when you're making these kind of changes. It needs to be, uh, you know, s uh, the change experts say, um, you can do a gradual change, you can do a very quick change. And uh, research still shows what is, uh, what is the one that is, that is working the very best. But um, as an HR manager, I have always found there is, there is a big correlation between my workplace experience as an employee and my engagement at work. So this is not a direct answer to your question, but uh, the, uh, the roundabout answer is that when I'm back at work, working full time, and I have two, two people in the family, my boss needs to make sure, Aniket needs to make sure that my workplace experience is not compromised, right? Because at the end of the day, if, uh, if I'm going to be shouting at my direct report and, and you're my manager, you keep shouting at me all the time. I'm not going to perform the customer service I need to perform for her, right? That as managers, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming many of us are in management roles here, many of us are in human resources, and I'm, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, we will, we will understand this and take back. So let us create, uh, you know, easier ways of getting back to work, right? You know, it could be uh, it could be daycare. Is does Nepal have daycare centers inside work? Um, some companies have, some don't. And uh, you know, is it about daycare? Is it about uh, easier access to uh, to medicines? Is it uh, can it be about uh, getting some more free time, uh, having uh, flexible workplaces, um, and uh, and all of that? If you went to a tech company, uh, you know, uh, a tech company's headquarters, like Amazon's headquarters. Um, they give out free bananas. Now you must be wondering why is a banana given? So there was joke saying this is all you will get paid, you know, when you. But they get got paid really well. So lots of things. At home, again, uh, my view is uh, you need to speak to your spouse, and uh, and your parents, and be able to get get you to be. At the end of the day, you know what? Not all of us are entrepreneurs, you know. And and let me be uh, very straightforward. We are all working professionals. And when you're a working professional, whether you like it or not, you make a lot of adjustments. And the way you make the adjustments is, is how your life will be. Long answer, Did, does that make sense? Is it okay? All right, so I'm gonna quickly move. Um, we have uh, probably a half hour uh, more. Um, I'm not gonna again talk uh, the whole thing, right? Um, it looks like many of you are transitioning at work and uh, from either from college or, or elsewhere. And the biggest thing, as I told you about my first experience at Unilever, are you better off uh, me standing there or here? Is this better? All right, this is better to me because the light is really getting onto my eyes and I'm old enough now, right? So, 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 so one of the things I realized is, you know, it's not as though I need to be, you know, knowing every answer. Um, today, you know, after 30 years of working, one thing I, I tell myself is if I don't know an answer, I should be able to, um, you know, just say I don't know the answer. You know, there is no reason for us all to be saying, I know all the answers and I can tell you the answers and sometimes it can be wrong answers too. The second one um, I've realized in, uh, in, my, in my career is that uh, um, experiment. We all know the word experiment, right? Now, oftentimes you also hear, my experiment failed. Did we say that? You know, you experiment something, you want to do a pilot, 
study and it doesn't give you the, uh, the result you want and you say, my experiment failed. My view is experiments never fail. Experiment give you a result. What failed is what you thought the experiment result will be. So I, I wouldn't get too worried about uh, not, not getting the experiment right, but get to where uh, you know, we need to be. And I'm not going to bother with uh, all the slides here. Uh, I talked about being, you know, understanding the business, being in the core of the business. Uh, but I think uh, one, big, one big thing that HR has still not achieved, you know, some companies like Unilever or, uh, um, you know, Google, Amazon, others have achieved, but several companies have not achieved is how do we use technology for our benefit, right? Do we have data? Do, can we make uh, analysis? Do we understand how people are thinking? Uh, for example, you know, if there is uh, a, a, a bit of discontent among your employees, do you know it today before it happens tomorrow, right? So I, I, I remember this uh, very vividly. I was at Amazon and uh, I was in Seattle and there was this uh, quarterly result of uh, the company that was being announced. So it was an analyst call, and somebody asked uh, Jeff Bezos, who was the CEO of the company at that time, uh, so uh, you achieved phenomenal results uh, today. Uh, how, what did you do in the last three months that this result came? He said, look, the result of today was determined three years ago, not three months ago. So you need to be relentlessly working towards it. So as HR professionals, I think, I think a big thing that we don't use very well is data, is analytics, is uh, using, uh, you know. Um, so for example, how many of, uh, how many of you use uh, employee satisfaction surveys? Employee surveys? Yeah. And uh, are these annual surveys? Annual and monthly. Annual and monthly? Sorry? Annual. See, most people do this on an annual basis, and you said you do it on a monthly basis. At Amazon, we used to do it on a daily basis. And uh, at Indigo, I do it uh, twice a month. So the intent is, can I be an HR function who can predict results, right? Can I be a predictive organization, or will I be a reactive organization? That is a big thing. So at Indigo, what we do is, uh, we have 32 questions which have been validated over many years through Aon surveys and all that. I ask the same set of 32 questions six times a year. Not 32 in the same order. I ask five questions uh, a week, and two weeks later I ask five questions, and I jumble questions. See, these 32 questions uh, are bucketed under various ways, my manager, my work, my compensation, my career, my learning. And I um, intermingle these questions, and I use uh, deep science and research, so I have an analyst on my team whose only job is to say, Raj, this question on my manager respects me, you know, gets a very high score in this month and a very low score in this month, and then there is a medium score in the middle month. Then the next question I ask is, what happened in that month? Why did that score go so high? Why did this go, score go so low? I need to be able to connect dots. See, most of us, I mean, who, many of us have uh, uh, studied statistics, right, uh, in, in college, and we use this term very loosely, correlation. We say, oh yeah, this correlates with that, so this should be the result. But the problem is, anything can correlate with anything, if you just use correlation, right? Uh, if uh, you are being attentive to me today, uh, for example, what's your name? Vandana. Vandana. So if Vandana is listening to Raj, and uh, there is uh, sunshine in Colombo, <laughs> right? That is correlation. So when the sun shines in Colombo, Vandana will, will, will listen to Raj. Is that uh, stupid or is that brilliant? That, doesn't make sense. that doesn't make sense, right? So what makes sense is causation. So we need to understand what causes it. Now, what causes Vandana to listen to Raj is not the sun in Colombo, but because of her own intent to listen to me. 
right? So we need to understand as HR professionals the difference between causation and correlation. And even as we get results out of these uh, beautiful questionnaires that we have, we need to find out what is causing what. And that's what I mean by uh, data and analysis. Um, so this is uh, the picture with uh, my son, and my son is uh, much older now. Um, both of us look pretty lean, my son and I, and that is uh, Duke. Duke seems to be enjoying our company, right? <laughs> On the picture, I'm not sure he is, or maybe he's saying, get, get me out of your clutches, boys. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, in, um, and again, this is not about change. It's about uh, personal success, and, and I'm trying to wind down to the last 15 minutes so we can have some more questions. The, the first thing that I, I realized is it is very easy to be smart than to be kind. Does it make sense? Um, now, um, smarts can happen in a variety of ways. You can go to XISs, you can go to uh, Unilever, you can uh, be in uh, Wharton School, you can be in um, INSEAD. Smarts can happen. Smarts can happen, you know, being with this group. You're probably a bunch of very smart people, and when I speak with all of you, I learn something or the other. But kindness, compassion, doesn't happen so easily. And uh, if, uh, if you like uh, YouTube videos, uh, try this. You know, uh, if you've heard of Jeff Bezos, the Amazon uh, founder, he's always known to be someone who is abrupt and arrogant and all of that. He's not like that. So if you, if you type uh, Jeff Bezos' speech at uh, Princeton University on, uh, on YouTube, you will find this little clip. It's a 10 minute kind of clip that talks about uh, how he suddenly realized that uh, he was being too smart and not kind. I will not tell that story, you listen to him. It's fantastic. If you know him and if you know a little bit of, uh, if you don't know him also, if you know what others think of him, you'll find that uh, story very, very fascinating. And you know, this past year in 2020, uh, two years ago, uh, we went through uh, the pandemic and we had to let go of 5,000 people in, uh, in Indigo. Now, letting go of 5,000 people is not easy. You had to do that in a very kind, compassionate manner. We made sure everyone that left, left with a letter that said that you're not being let go of for your performance, but we will hire you back when things get better. We gave them pay. We gave them an opportunity to go get an outplacement and all of that. So I think as HR people, kindness doesn't mean throwing money at people, but being kind in ways you deal with people and, and their problems. The, uh, the one that, uh, you know, I'm always fascinated with is uh, when people come and say, you know, I used to know this person for so long, but how did he change? He is not talking all negatively, he is all positive. But uh, a big lesson for me is that when you lead people, you will see different faces of the same people on the very same day. And don't get, uh, don't get uh, caught up with that, uh, with that problem. That, that will always happen. But the third one I have is probably more, more important. Um, have you heard this term, non-duality? Okay, have you, have you heard the term duality? Let me explain what duality is. What is the opposite of short? Tall, correct. Yeah, short, tall. What's the opposite of black? White. What is the opposite of man? No, that's not an opposite, <laughs> not a woman. So this is called duality, right? Long, short, you know, far, close. Uh, all, all this is duality. Most of us, when we make decisions, we make decisions like this, right? Vandana is a good lady or a bad lady, depending on where you know. But the problem is the truth is not good or bad. It is somewhere in between. And as, H as HR professionals, I think it is very important for us to understand. And uh, I don't know if you have heard of this uh, very ancient Indian saint. Uh, his name is Adi Shankara. Have you heard of Shankara in any of your books or wherever? So he's the one that wrote Advaita. So there was something called Dvaitam, and then he, he wrote Advaita. So the point I'm making is uh, don't just go by what you think is right or wrong, there is something beyond it. And that's, that's, a, very, that's a very important part of, uh, part of life. Um, 
In terms of change itself, um, I think uh, there are some very key life skills. And uh, this is a story I heard from um, uh, the, the Buddhist Vietnamese uh, monk I, I talked about a little earlier, uh, Thai, as we call him, Thich Nhat Hanh. And the story is like this. You know, it's about, oftentimes, we, uh, we kind of blame people, right? We tell, oh, you did this because of this, this happened. You did this because of this, this change did not happen, and so on and so forth. So this, this is a beautiful story. So there is this man who is trying to put a nail on the wall, right? So what do you need to put a nail on the wall? You need a hammer, right? So you have a nail, you have a hammer, and you keep nailing it. And suddenly, you know, you lose your uh, focus, and instead of uh, hitting on the nail, you hit on your thumb. And it pains, right? And when it pains, you know, the thumb doesn't, this thumb does not go and blame this hand or the hammer. You follow what I'm saying? You hit yourself, you don't actually blame this hand. You actually go and try and solve the problem first. You know, you say, okay, let, let, let me get some uh, ice, let me get some water, let me get this, let me get that. So that's wisdom and, and compassion. So, so when something goes wrong, don't, don't be quick to go blame somebody. You know, try and find out what may have happened is, is, what, is what, I, what I heard. Um, I don't want to bother with uh, all of this. So uh, I'm, I'm going to close, and, and maybe we can have uh, some questions um, and, and commentary as we, as we talk. So this story, again, is, uh, is about change. And the story is like this. Let me sip uh, a little bit of water. Oh, I was happy the light was not on, so <laughs> I came here. But that's fine. So the story is like this. There was this villager, and uh, he and his neighbor used to live really, really uh, happily, very happily. And one day, this villager decided to buy a donkey. So he bought the donkey and tied it outside his house. And this donkey came new to this, uh, to this place and started howling. You know how a do donkey howls, right? It was howling really hard. And, the, and, the, and his neighbor, who was a very good friend of his, came and said, please, can you do something about this donkey? It's not letting me sleep. And this villager said, no, I'm not changing. This donkey, I paid for it, and I'm going to keep it. This uh, neighbor of his really got angry. In a fit of anger, he gave him a slap. He fell down on a stone and died instantaneously. And when he died instantaneously, this, this, this man ran away because he's, he's actually murdered somebody. And the person who died, you know, he had two sons, and the two sons came along, and they went and asked the mother, what happened? And the mother said, you know what? The neighbor uncle killed your dad. These two, uh, you know, men again were, uh, were really, really so angry, they, they actually torched the house of the neighbor. They took fire and torched the house of the neighbor. How can you kill my dad? Torch the ho house of the neighbor. Then, when all this was happening, the devil was walking, and the devil was laughing, and, and the devil said, all you had to do was to release the donkey. This person would not have died, that house would not have been burnt. And then the devil came and released the donkey, and the donkey ran away. But whatever has happened has, al has already happened. So the story, I, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the logic behind the story is whenever you have you know, some change initiative, make sure you try and find the obvious answer rather than the not so obvious answer. And go release the donkey before the, the devil comes and releases it. So uh, I know I've, I've finished it uh, in um, probably about 20 minutes sooner than I intended uh, to finish, but uh, was this useful? Was, uh, did, was this good use of an hour and 40 minutes that we had together? And I'm happy to take any, any follow-up questions that uh, you may want to have or any uh, experience sharing like my colleague from Unilever did. So any, any questions any of you have? There is, there's a lot of bunch of questions at the back, so maybe if you can pass the microphone on. There's this, uh, this lady at the back as well. So we'll take uh, Vandanas first, and then we'll come to you, ma'am. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Vandana Buddha. 
I'm representing development sector here. Um, so my question would be, what do you think about change champions when we talk about, um, you know, any ch bringing any change about in the organization? What are your thoughts on identifying the change champions within the organization that will help the management to drive that change? Yeah, I think it's a great concept, Vandana, but I think change should come from everyone. Um, you know, you don't want this 10 people roaming around the offices and factories shouting, change, change, change. People will think they are mad, you know, the 10, 10 mad people are running. Rather than having change, champions should be one of the many several steps. The first step is to be able to explain why change. Now, oftentimes, as, I, as we saw when we started, you know, this uh, session, it's not easy to change. You know, even as, uh, you know, changing from one seat to another is not easy because you're moving away. And I can tell you how many of you or friends who are sitting in the same table moved to another table, sat with the same friends, right? It's, 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 very, it's very difficult. So that communication needs to come from the leader. And change can be for a variety of reasons. Now, for example, if, um, you know, the mobile phone, uh, you know, one of the uh, stories that I, I heard many years ago is, um, have you heard this company called Motorola? Motorola? And uh, Motorola is not existent anymore. Do you know that? It got merged. So somebody said the HR head of Motorola could have actually averted the collapse of Motorola. And I said, oh, really? Not the uh, salesperson, not the uh, marketing person, not the product person, but the HR person? He said, yeah. You know why? Because for a long time, Apple used to hire Motorola engineers. And uh, the HR person would always say, what is Apple going to do with uh, laptop engineers or telephone engineers? They are in, they're in some other business. And suddenly they realized iPhones came and Motorola phones were never bought anymore. So, so when you are getting into that kind of a change thing, the communication needs to start. And the communication only happens through storytelling, Vandana. You can have any number of uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations. You can have solid data. But unless somebody can stand up and say, why this is important, it will never happen. So as a process, you can have change champions, but change champions cannot be the way you start the process of change. Make sense? So there was uh, a lady at the back who, yeah. Hi, I'm Anjana from Home Loan Experts Nepal. And I've got a question for you. Uh, since you were a very young man when you started your career, <laughs> And you must have worked with, uh, you know, older generation of people having fixed mindset uh, who are not even ready to learn because they think, you know, they are the experienced person and they are the expert in their area. So how do you make change possible or how do you do a change in culture in such environment? You must have experience. I just wanted to ask you. Thank you. That's a great question, Anjana. And uh, I experience it even today. A lot of young people think, you know, this old man doesn't change. <laughs> right? So, um, um, I think it's a brilliant question. It's about, uh, a lot of times, it's, it's about uh, addressing the person and, uh, and trying to influence that person's mind and, uh, and thinking. How can you influence thinking, right? Uh, influencing thinking of another person is a very difficult thing. It is not easy because most of us don't think anyways, right? I mean, the process of thought itself is, uh, you know, we, we are actually happy watching a Netflix movie than to think. Now, in order to think is the first impediment. Second is, if somebody has to come and influence the way I think, is a second impediment. Now, if there is another person who doesn't think exactly the same way that I think, it is not, uh, Anjana, it's not as though that person is wrong and I am right. Right? See, a lot of times we come from uh, the, uh, the view that I am right and you're wrong. And that's why you get frustrated. You get, that's why you're saying this old man doesn't, doesn't get it. And this old man says this young kid doesn't, doesn't get it. The issue is, unless, under the, instead of thinking you're right, uh, sorry, I'm right and you're wrong, why don't we think, let's sit down and chat. And uh, oftentimes I have seen just a simple conversation that can happen over a period of time, trust is very important. If somebody has to 
understand you and agree with you, you need to be able to develop trust. And that trust happens with variety of ways, right? For example, I'll tell you, all of us uh, use laptops at work, right? All of us use mobile phones at work. And you're sitting and working on your laptop and you're doing some financial analysis and your wife calls on the phone. And you pick up the phone and uh, I'll tell you what, if you're, I'm now married for, I don't know, 25 years or so, my wife can tell me within 30 seconds that I'm not focusing on the conversation. I, I keep saying, ah, ooh, eh, and she'll say, Raj, why don't you either stop the laptop or tell me you'll call me later. So this is all uh, ways of trust. So your wife and your husband will tell you that, but your colleague will not. A young colleague or a old colleague will not. The person will just go back and say, oh, this person never listens. Anytime I speak to this person, he only gives one word answers. So find out 10 ways of gaining trust of this person, Anjana, and I'm sure the person will listen to you. Yep, do you have a microphone or can I get you one? Hi, good afternoon everyone. I am Simran Gorkali. I look after the corporate relationship of Afonsoft Group. So in a service industry like ours, there are a lot of youths and millennials working. For millionaires, uh, their aspiration keeps on changing every day. So how do we create stickiness for them to stick to our organization? How do we manage that? No, that's, uh, that's another good one. There is a lot of research um, that has uh, happened in uh, how do you how do you enthuse uh, millennials? But let me tell you this, the world is changing into what I would call gig working, flexible working, the world is changing. I can tell you 15, 20 years from now, you will, you will find at least 50% of the workforce, even in a country like Nepal, wanting to say, I don't want one job. You know, I mentor a lot of people. You said your name is Simran? Simran. So Simran, I mentor a lot of people right, in colleges, in, um, in offices, and, and all of that. One of my mentees is, um, is, is a second year uh, postgraduate uh, student. She came and asked me, Raj, I'm doing HR in this very prestigious college. This is XLRI in uh, Jamshedpur, very prestigious Indian HR Institute. She says, but I don't want to be an HR manager all the time. I love music. I want to be a DJ. She wants to be a DJ at night and work as an HR manager during the day. And I found it, huh? You're going to be a DJ in a bar and a pub, and the next morning you'll be as an HR manager and say you can't do these things, but that's going to be reality. Now, how do I find stickiness of that person to be in my company? I cannot find stickiness unless I can appreciate the person has a certain desire. And the desire comes from a very solid, you know, functional, uh, you know, expertise, both in terms of being a DJ and an HR manager, as well as the deep-rooted belief that I don't have to be just doing one thing. Um, you know, I, I have this friend of mine who runs uh, um, a, a company uh, back in Seattle, and she and I used to work together for many years in, in Amazon in Seattle. And she now runs a company, and uh, she finds uh, temporary CHROs. Can you believe it? If uh, Aniket goes on leave for two months, if I go on leave for two months, she can send a chief people officer for two months to come and work in my place. Now, these chief people officers don't want to come and work in, uh, you know, in companies. If I were to say Indigo is hiring a CHRO, the person may not even want to apply. But they may want to say, come and say, you know, I'll work for two months, I want to take uh, a month off. I'll work for three months, I'll take a month off. This actually used to happen many, many years ago. I talked about my Ford Motor Company example of going to Melbourne. And, uh, and during my um, Unilever days, we were actually making, um, in, in the Mysore factory, we used to make uh, tomato uh, ketchups. And uh, so we went to a, a, a tomato uh, ketchup manufacturing factory in, um, in, in Melbourne, Australia. And their employees only work six months a year. So six months they work, six months they take off. So these, all these are gonna happen. Stickiness will not happen if you like doggedly say, this is how it is going to be. You better follow it. If you don't follow it, they'll say, fine, I'll go somewhere else. So find out what interests are and what people want and try to see if those things work. Um, otherwise, uh, you will not have stickiness. <laughs>
Anyone else? All right. Oh, yeah, there is this lady there in the middle. Can someone pass a microphone to her, please? Uh, good morning, Mr. Raj, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Priyata, and I represent ActionAid International Nepal. We are an INGO. So since we are talking about change, my question to you is on that as well. So uh, during change, there are a lot of speculations and gossips between s staff. So uh, my question to you is, what is the importance of communication during the change process? Thank you. That's uh, the, Priyata, I, I can't uh, agree more than saying that is the only thing that is constant in, in a change process. Communicate, communicate, communicate. There could be rumors, there can be uh, all kinds of things, theatrics, antics. The only way to quell it is to be able to speak. And uh, the only way to uh, you know, communicate is not through emails. There could be a variety of ways of doing it. You could do small group meetings, you could have all hands meetings, you could do emailers, you could do video messages, but uh, the only way to, uh, and, and again, you need to come clean. You know, change is often a very, um, you know, um, uh, people doubt the veracity of the person when, when they talk about change. So the only way to come over this uh, people's doubts is to come clean. And the way to come clean is to communicate to be able to speak your intent, to be able to communicate in a logical manner and don't get angry when the process breaks down. Because change is a long process. As I said, starting from Greek philosophers to now, we continue to talk about change. And uh, change is also a big uh, you know, uh, money earner for the change consultants, right? So it's never gonna be easy. You need to have time, you need to have patience, and you need to communicate. All right. Oh, there's one more. Okay. Um, there's another question up there. Very good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, embracing and like uh, embracing the changing speech and all the lessons you just delivered now. My question to you is, uh, I'm Abhita Karki from Jagdamba Motorist Group. Yeah, Since, yeah, uh, like, uh, I want to relate my question between new employees and uh, old employees. When a new employee joins in the company, like, he is more likely to influence by the practice of the old employees that may be good or bad. So how, like, could you please uh, explain me your uh, opinion or your experience about regarding since you have worked in so many companies? Thank you. No, um, I think um, the new employee onboarding and uh, integration is a very key part of uh, employee engagement. If you cannot onboard an employee properly, and by onboarding I mean not just the technology, of giving a ID card and all of that, you need to have examples. Like for example, in, uh, in Amazon, when we were growing, we uh, wanted people to be able to ask questions to others who they thought knew the answers better than them, right? But we were growing exponentially. We were 1,000 people in one month, next month we were 4,000 people. So how do we find it? Then we said we will do it in a very easy, and uh, identifiable manner. So um, I don't have a lanyard. You have a lanyard, right? You have a red and yellow, uh, red and uh, white lanyard. So we said for anyone that has completed uh, two years of service in the company, we will give a certain color lanyard. If you have done five years, there is a different color. At 10 years, there's a different color. At 15 years, there's a different color. And you're visible from a distance. The intent was, if I have a question, a, curious question, inquisitive question, that I don't want to go and ask my manager. I can go ask the person who's wearing a yellow lanyard. So I used to have a yellow lanyard when I had done five years. And when I, when I get to 10 years, that color changes to red. And when I do 15 years, it, ch it changes to uh, silver. And uh, 
So it gives two things. It gives the pride, it gives the culture, yet it gives you answers uh, for questions that you, that you want to ask. The, the other one is to uh, continuously keep, um, you know, uh, I would, we, we used to call it uh, the wiki, the Amazon wiki, like a Wikipedia. So anything that you have, you put it on the wiki portal. So if there is a new HR process coming, if there is a new way of applying for leave, if there is a new technology that you are including, you put it all on the screen. No, the, the intent was none of this knowledge should reside in just the heads of people. They should be available for people to, uh, people to see. Again, that's an overall uh, culture thing. What else is an example? Uh, the other example, again, from uh, Indigo, is that uh, every year, uh, all of us, you know, in senior management and executive positions, uh, go through two days of customer connect training. And during customer connect training, we are expected to take live calls, be in the airports, you know, loading uh, bags, issuing tickets to, uh, to being in the ramp, to, uh, to driving, uh, if, if you're allowed to drive, you know, cars and all of that. The only way for older employees to continue to remain in touch with the good culture of the company is to keep reinforcing it. The problem with most of us is once we learn it, we don't want to do it again. Or we think it is uh, beneath our uh, dignity to do it, but we need to continue to, uh, to do it. And that's how you can influence new employees. That's my sense, but again, there could be more. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm an authority on this, but these are things that have worked for me. Thank you, so um, I think with that, um, we can come to a close, it's uh, 11.40. Oh, so there's one last one here. I really want a hot cup of coffee after this. <laughs> Thanks. Good morning, all. I'm Susesh Bhaitya from Saniva Bank Limited. Sir, I have got one curiosity uh, regarding your career aspect as well. So, so what, uh, how you embrace, your, you embrace the change from when you move from uh, General Electric to Air Indigo? Wow. Yeah, I mean, you need to understand uh, a few things. One is uh, what worked in General Electric is not going to work in Indigo all the time. Now, one thing I consciously stopped saying is, this is what we used to do in GE. This is how GE used to do it. Oh, this, is, this was great in GE. Now, when I continue, when I say that, people get irritated. They'll say, I mean, so if GE was so good, you could have stayed there. Why did you come here, right? So firstly, I stopped referencing my previous company all the time. The second thing I stopped doing was to keep bragging about myself and try to learn. And, uh, and, and then more importantly, culture gets developed when you speak to several different people. You need to be humble, you know, honesty and humility. Humility is a huge, huge virtue. I talked about kindness and compassion, but humility is even more, you know, when you are able to learn. I mean, learning only happens when you're humble. And uh, so uh, those three things and beyond it, try and understand the business, how does the business make money, and where are the opportunities to save. Uh, we are a huge, you know, uh, fixed cost company, you know, and we are a wafer thin margin company. So, you know, as an HR manager, I can make a terrible mistake by doing something with my compensation philosophy that can have a huge impact on the financials of the company. And I need to understand all of that. And uh, that takes time. And I cannot just keep saying, in Amazon we did that, in GE we did that, so we need to do that in Indigo. Firstly, stop the, I mean, use all your experiences from before, but stop bragging about them all the time. Right, so it's been uh, two hours, and I hope uh, this was uh, two hours well spent. Um, I could still see people smiling at the back, and some of you are on the phone, but that's okay. Um, I love being here and uh, love to be back again. And thank you very much, Shimonji, for the opportunity. And thanks for being such a great uh, group. Uh, you had, I don't know, you had probably 15 to 18 questions, you know, during, the, and, and I have never faced so many questions. Yesterday I was asking Monji at dinner, do people ask questions? And he said, yeah, sometimes, but you guys always ask. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, and it was a pleasure being with you. We are now requested a couple yet very, very comprehensive and enriching uh, 
uh, thoughts coming in, uh, uh, reflecting so rightly the essence of the theme that we brought uh, here. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time, your valuable thoughts and perspectives. It was a privilege and an honor to go through all that. And to extend our formal gratitude, may I invite up on stage the chairman of the uh, conference organizing committee and the executive director of Growth Sellers, uh, respectively, Mr. Mohan Oja and Madam Samjana Sharma. From the entire uh, conference participants and the organizing team to our keynote speaker, Mr. Raj Raghavan, for this very, very valuable <laughs> keynote. Books and real world are different. There is no ready-made answers to every problem, and that's why we need you, the HR. So just be aware of the opportunities and consider also the vulnerabilities facing you 